experiences. So as I mentioned at this point, you know, I walk you through how we do the inverse problem to go from the level one satellite data to the level two atmospheric composition information. And now we can take this level two information and do the inverse problem again to go after the surface emissions, which is what we're interested in from uh, 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 you know, air quality perspective or in terms of uh, estimating carbon sources of sinks. So the problem is similar, but slightly different now. Our problem is that we're starting off with some set of emissions, which in our atmospheric model represents a set of parameters P. And these emissions uh, are being are used as essentially boundary conditions in our model to produce uh, atmospheric uh, concentrations of CO or CO2 or methane, depending on uh, the emissions of interest. And for the inverse problem, we are interested in, in, in looking at the discrepancies between our model simulation of say carbon monoxide and the Moffat observations to use this discrepancy to try to optimize the emissions to bring our model into agreement with the observations given the uncertainty we have on the observations and our prior uncertainty on the emissions, uh, assuming we take a Bayesian approach. So in this case, the expression for the analysis looks pretty much the same as I showed you before with the difference being that for the inverse problem, we're estimating the atmospheric state, the CO concentrations in the atmosphere, X, but now we're interested in estimating the model parameters P, which are the emissions, the surface emissions. So M in this case would be our atmospheric model that takes the state at some time, I plus the emissions and propagates that forward in time to I plus one. When we construct the, uh, the, the innovation in the analysis, our observation operator has to account for not only the, any interpolation in space and time, that's needed to go from our model to our observation. And so that spatial interpolation is indicated here by this subscript J, but it also have, has to account for the smoothing influence of the satellite retrieval so that we can properly map our model into the satellite space. And so the observation operator here now has to account for the averaging kernel in the case of uh, uh, say Moffat CO, the averaging kernels that I showed you before as well as the prior information that went into the Moppet retrieval to produce the level two data that we're assimilating. The observation operator may not necessarily be linear. This retrieval could actually be nonlinear. And in that case, you know, we would linearize it to produce the tangent linear model. So it's just the derivative of this observation operator with respect to the model parameters. And that's what's used here in this analytical expression for the analysis. And before we had B for the background information, but now B sub P represents the a priori covariance for the emissions as opposed to the covariance for the state that we talked about before when we went from the satellite radiance to the state. So it's very much the same approach, same equations. The big difference here is the change in the observation operator and the change in the uh, control vector going from the state previously to the emissions in this case. So I'll, you know, rather than going through the technical details of this, I'm gonna show you some applications of this approach and talk about the implications of the inversion approach that's chosen and the observations that are being used. So one very nice example is from uh, 2006. This is an example of the type of early uh, inversions that were done using Moppet data shortly after the data became available. The analysis expression is shown here. Many of these early inversion analyses starting from the late 1980s through the, the, the early 2000s for computational reasons used a fairly low resolution to, uh, grid for the inversion. So the emissions P were discretized into very large geographical regions to form the control vector. And the reason for this is that to construct the H matrix in these inversions, we perturbed separately the emissions in each of the individual regions here, and then propagated those perturbations in the emissions through the atmospheric model to construct the columns of the H matrix. So for each of these regions, you perturb the emissions 
you run it through the model, sample it at the observation locations and time, and in doing so, you construct the column of the H matrix. And so you can see why for computational reasons, you know, starting from, as I said, the late 1980s through until about 20, 15 years or so though, it was computationally expensive to run these inversions with more than you know, 10 to 50 elements in the state vector here, in the control vector. So in this inversion, uh, they broke up the surface emissions of carbon monoxide into these large geographic regions and constructed the H matrix, as I said, by running these per perturbations through the model uh, as a function of time to get monthly mean estimates of carbon emission, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide emissions, sorry, uh, from each of these large regions uh, you know, on a monthly basis. Okay. So monthly mean emissions stepping through the year. To give you a sense as to how well this works, and it works reasonably well, uh, considering where we were at that time, this is showing the difference between the observations, the MAPA data, and the prior model simulation. So with the a priori estimates of the, the, the emissions. And you can see there are large discrepancies between the model and uh, the, the model and the observations with the model being biased low in the winter hemisphere. So here in, in April in the Northern hemisphere and then here in, uh, in September in the Southern hemisphere. Once the emissions are optimized, you can pass those optimized emissions through the model again and generate a set of uh, posterior CO2 fields and look at the residual differences between the observations and the optimized model. And you see that these biases are much smaller now than what we started with before. So this is a paper by Ave Aralano. That's part of, he did this as part of his uh, PhD thesis. And you can see in the middle here, the emissions, the monthly mean emissions, it's a function of time, the emissions here are in teragrams of carbon monoxide per year for each of the different regions that are plotted. Uh, so some of the different regions that are plotted here. I don't want you to focus on the details here. There are, two, there are two aspects here that I want you to look at. One is that compare the red line, which is the posterior emissions to the black line. And if you look at Southern Africa, you see the prior emissions had a peak here in early summer, boreal summer, and a secondary peak here in late summer. And the posterior emissions suggested a shift in the phasing uh, with just a peak in late summer, which is much more consistent with what we now know about uh, these emissions from Southern Africa. And the other thing is to look at the, the red line, which is the posterior emissions with this green line. This green line is from a prior study that was published a year or two before this study that used Moppet observations to also estimate monthly mean emissions in a time dependent manner. And in the case of Southern Africa, the emissions are fairly consistent. There's some differences, but they're fairly consistent. For Europe and Asia, you can see there's a big difference between the posterior results from this study and the posterior results from the previous study shown here in green. And I'll try to come back to that a little bit later on toward the end of the talk. And if I don't explain why they're so different, someone can perhaps remind me in the chat if you're curious. So this was really the, the sort of the state of the art about 15 years ago, these big region inversions, uh, which you know, we had to do for computational reasons. The problem with this is that there's a tacit, tacit assumption being made that we know what the subgrid scale variability in the emissions are for each of these regions. If you have an error in, these, in the subgrid structure of the emissions, that will introduce an aggregation error in the inversion that will bias the inversion because Implicitly, what we're doing here is we're, we're coming up with one correction factor for all of the emissions within this entire large region. And if, there, if the spatial structure is wrong and the observations aren't dense enough to allow us to capture that, we can produce an, uh, an aggregation error. And that can be quite large in some cases. So ultimately, you know, we really want to construct the inversion, carry out the inversion at the highest spatial resolution possible, preferably at the resolution of the model itself. And then you can, based on the smoothing aspects of the inversion, decide what are the spatial scales to which you should aggregate your estimates given where you have information from uh, the observations and where you don't. But by assuming these large grid uh, boxes, it, you know, you're, you're, you're setting yourself up to uh, incur an aggregation error. But for computational reasons, this was the, the way things were done for this type of analytical inversion at the time. 
over the years, over the last 10 years, as a result of computing power, it, it's now possible to do these inversion, analytical inversions, but with very high spatial resolution. This is a paper looking at the inversion of methane data from the GOSAT satellite to estimate global methane emissions by Brian Massacres from Harvard uh, that was published in 2019. And here it's a grid-based inversion with uh, 2,025 elements in the uh, control vector. And here they're perturbing each of these elements to construct that H matrix. And they can do this because we now have access to massively parallel computing systems. And also many of the matrices are sparse matrices. So you can take advantage of a lot of the space sparse matrix uh, tools and the parallel computing capabilities that we have today to do this inversion in an analytical framework at high spatial resolution. And it works beautifully. It really is a very nice example of you know, the, the value of some of the uh, computing tools that we have today. So on the left here, we have the prior methane emissions that went into their inversion. On the bottom left are the posterior, so what they estimated from the analysis. This is showing the ratio of the posterior to prior emissions, so showing the change as, as a result of the inversion. But because you have all of these matrices and you can take advantage of the fact that they're sparse matrices, you can also easily construct the averaging kernel for this inversion to isolate where you have sensitivity to methane surface emissions. And this plot on the top right is showing the grid boxes where there is sensitivity to the emissions, where the estimate of the emissions uh, has sensitivity to the actual true emissions. So similar quantity to what I showed you for the satellite retrieval can be derived for the uh, uh, emission inverse problem. The Size of the state vector, as I said, is 2,025 elements, but the degrees of freedom per signal is only 128. So we are able to constrain, and as you'll see, emissions from some of the major source regions, but there's still significant smoothing. There's still large parts of the globe where we don't have a strong signal, given the obs observing system that we have to estimate these emissions reliably. One of the things that this uh, study was addressing is this you know, uh, ongoing puzzle, this outstanding puzzle regarding the increase in methane in the atmosphere. This is showing methane measurements as a function of time. So monthly mean methane, global average, globally average from the 1980s to the present. And in the mid, starting in the late 19, uh, in the early 1990s, we saw that the growth rate started leveling off. And essentially methane flattened in the atmosphere. The growth rate just flattened uh, for, a, for about a decade, the, the methane stopped increasing. And then around 2005, it started increasing again. And so this analysis was interested in, this study was interested in using GOSAT data to try to understand this increase in emissions that we, we saw uh, after 2005. And they attributed a lot of this to uh, tropical wetlands. They're arguing that the tropical wetlands are contributing a large fraction uh, to a large fraction of this trend, this global trend, about 43% of the trend here is coming from wetlands, mostly in the tropics, uh, some in Asia as well. And that oil and gas accounted for about 11% of the trend and livestock about 16% of the trend. So, there are still limitations with the satellite observations, as you can see from the total uh, degrees of freedom per signal, the number of independent pieces of information that we can get from the data, but the data are good enough to start allowing us to answer some really important questions like, you know, how is oil and gas contributing to global trends in methane? Uh, you know, we can start to try to tease out what's driving some of the signals that we're seeing here. So the point of this slide was to show how we can do this grid-based inversion as a result of the computing power that we now have compared to say 20 years ago. However, 20 years ago, we, could, we were able to do grid-based inversions using adjoint approaches. So the adjoint approach or the 40-var approach uh, Colin talked about on Tuesday as well, this is a way of taking advantage of the adjoint to which would give us a sensitivity of the model state to the uh, model parameters very efficiently. And so it's a nice way to do a grid-based inversion without having to take this brute force approach 
to perturb every element in the control vector. Of course, the drawback is you need to develop the adjoint of the model, and that's computation. That's uh, very expensive to do, even with uh, automatic uh, differentiation software. Okay. And often those software can sometimes provide code that's not optimal and requires a lot of manual tweaking. So it is an expensive thing to do, but if you can do so, develop the adjoint for the model, it's a very nice tool that you would then have at your disposal. So the 40 bar approach, as discussed briefly uh, yesterday and on Tuesday, is a smoother that tries to assimilate observations over a time window, over an assimilation window. And the way to think about it, the way I should, I should say, the way 40 bar is typically used in the atmospheric sciences community is we try to optimize the initial model state at the beginning of some time period, a simulation window, so that we can construct a model trajectory over that time period to best match all of the observations that are available over that interval. So if you have a model forecast that takes a trajectory that's of, uh, that, uh, that's of this form here, we want to use all of the observations distributed over this time interval to optimize the initial state so that we get a better trajectory to match the observations over that interval. And we use the model adjoint to project this information from the observations back onto our initial state to optimize that initial state to get the trajectory that better matches the observations. So the model trajectory over that time period is providing a very strong constraint on the optimization. We're assuming that when we estimate our initial state and try to project that forward in time, or take the information from the observations and project them back in time to the adjoint, that is being done without any errors being introduced. So the model is assumed to be perfect in terms of how we uh, use the information distributed over the simulation window. Okay? So it's a strong constraint on the optimization and this initial state optimization is called strong constraint 40 bar. So this is how it's typically used in the, uh, certainly in the uh, numerical weather prediction community. For the inverse modeling community, it is slightly different in, in, in formulation. So in terms of estimating emissions with 40 var, there are two different approaches. Uh, you can estimate the initial state as well as the model parameters. So this is the same cost function. I didn't go into details of the cost function in the interest of time, uh, but it's, it's, it's very similar to, to what you saw on Tuesday. But now instead of uh, having only this background term as a constraint in the optimization, you also have this term for the emissions as well, the parameters in the optimization. The issue here, of course, is that we don't really have a dynamic model for the emissions. So the 40 var, and this is why I put 40 var in quotes here, the, the, the 40 component isn't, doesn't strictly hold for the emission estimation. And this is, you know, this goes back to the discussion that we had that uh, on Tuesday after Colin's talk uh, about how you need to modify each of these different schemes for your particular application. In the case of the emission estimation, we don't have a dynamic model for the emissions or the surface fluxes, but we are using the model dynamics to propagate that information forward in time to take advantage of the smoothing aspects of 40 var so that we can use observations from the future to inform the fluxes in the past, the emissions in the past. So it is, it is a 40 var system. So it is, you know, the 40 component is there, but we're not evolving uh, uh, the emissions using a, a dynamic model. So there's a fundamental difference there that's important to be aware of. The other approach that's often used is one in which we just optimize only the emissions and not even the initial state. And this usually requires some other means of optimizing the initial state. And then from that optimized initial state, you then construct the, uh, you then do the inversion to get the emission estimates. So I'll show you an example of, of, of how that's done. So here is an analysis in which we use this 4D bar scheme to quantify CO2 fluxes using data from the GOSAT satellite. And in this paper, we were interested in looking at the differences, uh, the constraints that we get from observations uh, over land versus observation uh, versus uh, combining the observations over land with ocean data. And the motivation here is that if you look at the green colors here, these are land data, you see that there are regions where there are significant gaps in the observational coverage. And this 
these are regions where you have persistent cloud cover and the satellite cannot see through clouds, of course. And so we don't have data in those regions. But if we have ocean data, we can capture the outflow from these continental regions and use that information over the ocean to try to inform our estimates of the fluxes over the continental regions. And in this analysis, we assume that 12 month simulation window to estimate monthly mean fluxes. So we're taking advantage of the fact that 40 VAR is a smoother and we can use observations from, you know, if we're estimating fluxes in January, for example, we can use observations from February, March, April, May with the adjoint to project that information back onto the, uh, the, the January fluxes. And we want to do this, we want to use as much data as possible because of the nature of the observations that we have. If the observations don't provide really dense sampling over your domain, you may not be able to use uh, an assimilation window of only a day to estimate uh, daily fluxes. Uh, in the case of the orbiting carbon observatory, the repeat cycle for the orbit is 16 days. For GOSAT, it's about three days. So you really want to use a long window to get as much information as possible from the observations to inform your fluxes. Another issue is the strength of the signal in the observations. Um, many of these fluxes don't have a very strong signal on the, uh, on the, uh, in the observations. And so you want to use as much data as possible to get more robust flux estimates. So in our case, we ran with these 12 month assimilation uh, windows and use only the first six months of each year to estimate our prior fluxes. The idea being we want to ensure that every month has at least six months worth of observations informing the flux estimate that we, uh, that we provide. So we step through time at these 12 month intervals, taking only the first 12 months, uh, six months of data and then starting the next assimilation cycle shifted six months ahead and run and ran that forward for 12 months. And you know, an example of the type of fluxes that we estimate are shown, uh, shown here for 2010, 2011, and 2012. The red colors indicate emissions of CO2 to the atmosphere. The blue colors represent uptake of CO2. And you know, if you look, it's very nice actually, if you look at 2010 over South America versus 2011 versus 2012, you can see a significant change in the emissions, and this is because 2011 was a La Nina year, and we we're seeing the uh, impact of uh, precipitation changes in Brazil uh, acting on the fluxes here during the La Nina conditions compared to uh, the El Nino conditions that we had in 2010. So this is one approach using the adjoint to estimate uh, fluxes at the grid box scale, and it's a very computationally efficient way of doing so, when you have a large number of, uh, of uh, a large uh, state space, as opposed to the brute force approach that I talked about. Another way of doing so is using an ensemble uh, common filter. And the carbon tracker system at NOAA is a very beautiful example of the use of an ensemble common filter for a, a CO2 flux estimation. This is using uh, uh, an atmospheric model called TM5. Uh, globally, they run at core spatial resolution, but over North America, they run at a higher resolution of one by one degree, since this is really focused on providing uh, North American fluxes, but they do provide global fluxes as well. The operation of carbon tracker uh, fluxes that are available are uh, typically simulate surface data, ship-based data, aircraft observations using a square root ensemble common filter scheme. And they estimate weekly fluxes in predefined echo regions. So with the common filter, you can very efficiently estimate fluxes at the grid base, grid box scale. Uh, but for a carbon tracker, they realize that the observations aren't able to provide constraints on the fluxes at those scales. But they also know that, as I said, you don't really want to do the inversion at very coarse scales and introduce an aggregation error. And so the compromise they chose is a very nice one in which they, start off with these coarse regions that were developed for a historical, for into comparison projects starting in the late 1990s. And in each of these large geographic domains, they then further divided the region into 19 different echo zones based on the vegetation types that are present. So the inversion is done on these uh, echo zones rather than at the grid box scale uh, and you know the idea is that 
by optimizing the individual, the individual echo zones, you are less likely to incur an aggregation error as a result of, uh, of a subgrid, incorrect subgrid scale estimate of the, the fluxes. So in their case, they are running with 150 ensemble members perturbing these echo zones to construct the H matrix, which uh, as part of their, 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 their ensemble analysis. And the analysis produces fluxes that look like this on the echo, uh, these echo regions, which they can then interpolate onto a one by one degree grid, which is what's reported when you download the data uh, from their website. And this relies on a terrestrial biosphere model to help guide this, uh, this aggregation here, or interpolation, I should say. So, you know, just to be clear, for this region here, this uh, boreal region in North America, these are the echo zones that are optimized. And for the temperate North American region here, these are the echo zones that are being optimized. So where we are today in the community is, you know, most of the inversions are using either a 40 var scheme or some kind of an ensemble common filtering scheme to optimize these fluxes at the grid base, grid box scale or close to it. And we now have in support of, uh, some of the satellite missions, you know, a very large and active international community focused on producing uh, fluxes. As an example, we have the uh, OCO2, the Orbiting Carbon Observatory Model into Comparison Project. This is an ongoing activity to take advantage of the OCO2 data as well as GOSAT data to try to provide flux estimates that can be used by the international community for carbon cycle studies. So we have there uh, nine different, 10 different groups involved in this that are listed here, the models and the, uh, the, the different institutions. Our group is one of the groups involved here. And you know, there's three different models that are participating in the analysis. And unfortunately, most of us are using the 40 of our scheme. There's a carbon tracker that's using the ENKF scheme. And there's one, uh, project at CSU that's using an analytical uh, Bayesian inversion approach. So there's some variety, but not enough diversity across all of the different groups here to give us a true spread of, of how the different models and inversion frameworks might impact the fluxes. I'm showing you here an example of the fluxes that we get from the analysis. This is showing the ensemble mean, so the mean of the 10 different fluxes that are, the 10 different fluxes that we get from the various groups when we assimilate only the surface data or different flavors of the satellite observations. And you know, I think the key thing that I want to point out here is that if you assimilate you know, one set of satellite data versus a different set of satellite data, you, you do see some differences in the fluxes. But what's emerged over the last five years is that there's some really coherent signatures that we are picking up that is telling us something about the carbon cycle. Uh, and it, it's actually quite exciting. Uh, some of what we're seeing right now. And a, a beautiful example of that is this uh, paper that was published by Palmer et al. in uh, Nature Communications uh, two years ago. And this, uh, in this analysis, there were three different models. Some of them participated in this model into comparison project that I mentioned before. And they looked at using its surface measurements, uh, situ data versus two different satellite data, OCO2 and GOSAT, and found that across the tropics, there is a strong emission signature of carbon. And in particular, the tropical African biosphere seems to be a very large, provide a very large source of carbon to the atmosphere. They are seeing that tropical Africa provides about 1.5 to 1.65 petagrams of carbon to the atmosphere. And this is quite unexpected. And there are two, centers of emission that they've identified, one over Western Ethiopia, one over uh, Western tropical Africa. Yeah, this is not something, this is a large source of carbon, much larger than we expected. And it, the results seem to be robust. It was a beautiful uh, study that uh, came out of this, yeah, this Edinburgh group. Uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a surprise. And this is generating a lot of uh, interest, a lot of new research activity in the community. At the OCO2 science team meeting uh, recently, we learned from Art McDosh at uh, Leicester in the UK that they're now working on producing uh, uh, measurements in Africa. They're, they've set up a site in Uganda near Lake Victoria where they're trying to make ground-based measurements 
that would provide some complementary constraints on the African carbon budget to help us understand you know, what we're seeing here from the satellites. What you know, are the results that we're getting from the inversions using satellite data that suggest this very large source of carbon realistic? Is this, are the results, you know, they're robust across the models, but are they real? And uh, unfortunately, we just don't have a lot of data across Africa to help us understand what's going on there. And so this is, as I said, generated a lot of interest and uh, spurred new research focusing on the uh, African carbon uh, balance. So far, I've talked a fair bit about how we go after fluxes and in the grid-based uh, context versus this big region context. You know, there's work using 40 var schemes, using ENKF schemes, and implicit in many of these analysis is that our models are unbiased. We don't really have a way of dealing with systematic errors in the models. And that is becoming a critical issue for the carbon inverse modeling community. And we're starting to see and push now to try to better characterize systematic errors in our atmospheric models, just the way the satellite teams that do these uh, retrievals, this inversion analysis to produce the level two data, focus a lot on characterizing biases in their inversions and mitigating those biases. We now are trying to do the same in our atmospheric models to provide more robust flux estimates. And one approach for doing that, that you know, my group has been looking at is using a weak constraint 40 var approach. As I mentioned a few slides before, in the 40 var case, you optimize the initial condition and use the model to project that initial condition over your simulation window, assuming that the model does so perfectly. And so, as I said, it's called strong constraint 40 var because you're using the model trajectory as a strong constraint in the optimization. In weak constraint 40 var, we recognize that there may be errors introduced in the propagation of the state forward in time, and those errors are represented by eta. So we can modify the weak constraint approach and optimize not only the initial condition, which is being projected forward in time by our model, but also these eta terms, these model error terms at every time step over the simulation window. So the cost function for the 40 var looks very similar, but now we have an additional term that's added to it because we've taken these error terms and we've incorporated them into the control vector. And of course, we need to come up with an error covariance for these model errors. So there's this Q here, say uh, model error covariance, but otherwise the optimization looks very much the same. And there's a fair bit of flexibility in terms of how you deal with this eta. You can imagine, for example, if you just had a constant eta over the entire simulation window, this eta you can think of as just a large scale bias in which you're scaling the trajectory up or down. You can optimize eta at the same time step as the model, so uh, as written here, where eta uh, varies from uh, time step one to n, or you can choose to uh, optimize eta at a different time step at a different temporal resolution than the rest of the model. And that's uh, what we've been exploring in our analysis. This reconstrained approach you know, uh, really was nicely described in an early paper by Derber in 1989 called the Variational Continuous Assimilation Technique. And here he, he says, just going through the abstract, because in this variational continuous simulation approach, the model equations do not have to be satisfied exactly, some of the effects of systematic model errors can be removed from the simulation. Thus, the variational continuous simulation technique was able to consistently fit the data better than the adjoint technique. And what's really nice from our perspective is, as he notes here, as a byproduct of this technique, an empirical correction for the model systematic error is produced. And we were interested in, in, in this aspect of it, in trying to use this weak constraint as a way of trying to characterize the potential systematic errors in our atmospheric model. There was work that was done independently suggesting that at coarse resolution, there were vertical transport errors in the model. The vertical transport was too sluggish in the model. And so we were curious as to whether with this weak constraint approach, we can characterize that and hopefully mitigate it in the context of our inversion work. The, some of the results 
from using this reconstrained approach was published recently in this paper by uh, Stanovich et al. This is work done by former student Ilya Stanovich. And here we assimilated GOSAT methane data into our model at two different resolutions, at a coarse four by five resolution and a slightly higher two by two and a half degree resolution. For this analysis, we focused just on the February through May time period to look at the uh, these eta terms, try to characterize the eta terms to see if they can tell us something about the vertical transport errors within the model, to see if they're systematic transport errors in the model, to see if the eta terms can point to the, the presence of these systematic errors that we think were present in the model. So just to give you a sense as to how this works, uh, on the left here are monthly mean differences between the model with the prior methane emissions and the GOSAT observations for March, April, and May. And uh, you know, I want you to focus on these three regions here, East Asia, Central Africa, and South America. So here in Central Africa and East Asia, the model is biased high relative to the GOSAT data. And in Northern South America, the model is biased low relative to the data. When we use the weak constraint approach to optimize the model states, we optimize the initial methane distribution as well as these eta terms over the uh, simulation window uh, with a moving window uh, over this uh, time period from February through uh, May 2010, we end up with residual differences that look like this. So you can see these biases in the model relative to the data are significantly reduced and we match the data fairly well. Okay. So what do the eta terms look like? This, these corrections that are being added to the model state uh, over the assimilation window. So on the right are plotted uh, the, the mean eta terms averaged for uh, March through May. The top panel shows the uh, latitude, longitude distribution of these mean eta terms in the upper troposphere at around uh, eight kilometers. This is at the surface. And if we focus just on the surface one to begin with, you can see that over Central Africa, we have this downward correction of the methane, which is consistent with the fact that the model is biased high. Similarly, over East Asia, we have a downward correction of the methane because of the high bias. And over Northern South America, we see this upward correction of the methane due to this low bias. The warm colors here, yellow to red, represent a positive increase in methane, and the blue colors represent a negative uh, change in methane in the, in the model. And it's really just these eta terms that are, being that are being added to the model. And you can see there's very nice structure that emerges. If you look in the upper troposphere over East Asia, you see these negative corrections persisting throughout the column, the atmosphere column, but right offshore over the continent, we see the change in sign. So you go from negative corrections to positive corrections uh, downwind. We can now take a slice through the atmosphere at 34 degrees north and look at the vertical structure of these corrections. So this is showing altitude versus longitude along this red line here. And over East Asia, we see this negative correction in the surface that propagates up through the column all the way in altitude up through the upper troposphere. But then we see this change in sign down, uh, downwind. And this nice dipole pattern off the coast of Asia is consistent with our prior belief that the vertical transport in the model is too sluggish. And so not enough of the methane was being exported from the continent off over the North Pacific. So too much of it was being trapped, contributing to this overestimate that we see here. With the state optimization using this weak constraint approach, we're able to correct for this overestimate over the continent because of this trapping and also produce more, uh, add more methane downwind where you would expect to see more of methane from the outflow. And the same thing applies for Africa. If we now look at along the equator here, where we have these negative corrections, you see these negative corrections here, but then you see increased export off the coast of, uh, 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 off the coast of Africa over the Atlantic towards South America. 
So this really shows the beauty of using this mean, this, uh, this weak constraint approach to try to diagnose the systematic errors in the model transport. And we're now applying this for our carbon dioxide assimilation as well to try to mitigate some of the transport related biases that we know are present in the model when we run coarse resolution to hopefully get more re reliable estimates of the CO2 fluxes uh, than what we've been able to do in the past. I'm gonna change gears a little bit. Much of what I've been talking about so far has focused on using you know, observations of a single trace gas to estimate emissions of that particular trace gas. So in the case here, we're using methane observations to say something about methane uh, fluxes in the atmosphere or CO2 observations to say something about CO2 uh, fluxes to the atmosphere. But there is growing realization in the community that we need to assimilate uh, multiple trace constituents to better constrain the potential chemistry biases that are present in our atmospheric models, because biases in the chemistry can also impact the flux estimates. And we, until recently, have ignored those biases. A beautiful example of how we can do that is by looking at carbon monoxide. So going back to this carbon inversion problem, this is a paper by Bojang looking at the atmospheric budget of carbon monoxide over this 18 year period from 2000 to 2017. And the key thing here is to realize that when we talk about carbon monoxide, it's not only produced from combustion of fuel, from fuel combustion or wildfires, biomass burning, CO is also produced from the oxidation of methane and other non-methane hydrocarbons, those all produce CO. It's removed in the atmosphere by reaction with the hydroxyl radical OH. If you are using a model to infer emissions of CO because you're interested in getting at the fuel combustion emissions and how they're changing in time, if you have a bias in methane or a bias in the OH in your model, that will produce a bias in, those biases will get projected onto the estimated emissions. So it's really critical to try to characterize these, uh, these, uh, these biases. And that study that I showed you before where there were differences, uh, the, the early Moffat study where there were differences between the two different studies, a large part of that is due to discrepancies in the OH in the models. So in this paper, they took advantage of observations of methane to provide a constraint on the methane source. Formaldehyde, which is a byproduct of the oxidation of hydrocarbons to provide a constraint on the hydrocarbon source of CO. And they also took advantage of measurements of methachloroform, which is a CFC that reacts with OH to provide a constraint on the OH in the atmosphere. And in doing so, they can now constrain the chemistry much better, mitigate a lot of possible chemistry errors in the model and get more robust uh, signals, estimates of the CO fluxes. And in the interest of time, I'm focused on just on this picture here. This is showing the linear trend in the CO sources that they inferred. And you can see reductions in CO emissions, so negative trends across Eastern North America, Europe, and parts of East Asia. And this is really consistent with what we see in the MAFA data over the last 20 years, CO concentrations have been going down, driven largely by the reduction in, uh, in emissions from uh, these regions. These signals are now fairly robust. In the tropics for this particular inversion, they showed uh, some positive trends over Africa that they associated with uh, uh, anthropogenic uh, emissions, but this signal is not as robust. In different sensitivity experiments that they ran in the study, there were some differences that showed up uh, in the tropics. So, you know, these signals are much more robust than the signals we're seeing in the tropics. Now, the final example that I have is, is, is one of a multi-constituent assimilation that integrates a fairly broad suite of observations to provide a consistent description of the chemical evolution of the atmosphere over a given time period. This is an analysis from Kazu Miyazaki at JPL using an ensemble common filter assimilation scheme to assimilate a broad range of chemical constituents from 2005 to 2018 to constrain various aspects of the chemistry. So this schematic here shows the really messy world of tropospheric chemistry that is embedded in our atmospheric models. And discrepancies in the chemistry here will impact the flux emissions that we estimate when we use these models in an inverse modeling context. But the good news is that we have satellite observations and the in situ observations as well 
of a large number of these constituents. And so we can combine those data together in a multi-constituent assimilation to provide a fairly strong constraint on, uh, I shouldn't use that word, a good constraint on, on the chemistry uh, and thereby get better estimates of the fluxes, but also start to use these reanalyses because this is a reanalysis to try to understand the chemical evolution of the atmosphere as a result of anthropogenic uh, emissions, uh, as a result of pollution emissions over time. And the, there's some very nice work that's coming out of JPL doing that. I'll show you quickly on the next slide, next slide, uh, some examples of just how nice this system uh, behaves. So the first example is showing vertical profiles of, of ozone in the troposphere in the lower part of the atmosphere. The blue line is a control model without any assimilation. The black line are balloon measurements, ozone sound measurements of ozone in the atmosphere. And the red line are the uh, reanalysis. So these are the ozone uh, coming out of the assimilation system. Bend in latitudinal bins from the Southern hemisphere to the Northern hemisphere. And on the bottom, this is the percent bias. And you can see if you focus here, the control run is clearly has some fairly large biases, which are significantly reduced in the reanalysis. The bottom line is just showing the uh, root mean squared errors. And you're seeing significant error reduction as well as a result of bringing together this large suite of observations. If you look at the change in surface NOx emissions, this is showing the trend in the in NOx emissions. As I mentioned earlier, NOx is a precursor gas that leads to ozone production. And you can see across North America, Europe, and parts of Asia, there are clear negative trends, strong negative trends. I talked about this early at the beginning of the lecture. In South Asia, we're seeing an increase in NOx emissions over this time period. These are the trends in carbon monoxide. Here are the negative, this robust signature that I talked about before on the previous slide, showing the negative trend in CO over North America, Europe, and Asia as well. The OH radical, which reacts with carbon monoxide, changed dramatically in the analysis. So this is showing the total uh, carbon monoxide, the carbon monoxide is a function of latitude and time. So it's a Hofmuller plot. And uh, you can see, if we just focus on this one here, just the seasonal variation in OH, there's a strong seasonal cycle because it's driven by uh, sunlight reacting with, uh, with ozone and water vapor. However, when you do the analysis, we see a significant increase in OH. So this would suggest that if you use the control model to estimate carbon monoxide emissions, this OH is biased quite, is, 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 bi is, is biased, which would then introduce a bias in the, in the flux estimates that you would make, get for CO. So with the multi-constituent approach, we now have a really nice way of constraining more of the chemistry to provide this consistent description of, of, of uh, the chemical evolution of the state. And there's work being done now to look at using these reanalyses to better understand trends and use them for, uh, you know, for air quality studies and looking at health impacts and so on. So the suite of satellite observations that we now have really are allowing us finally in a data simulation context to start bringing together many different types of satellite observations to constrain the atmospheric state as well as the surface fluxes. I was hoping to spend a little bit of time talking about a new project that we are just writing up in our group in which we're using machine learning as a way to combine this information that we get from these chemical reanalyses with in situ observations and that sort of transfer learning. But I will skip this in the interest of time so that we have time for discussions and just jump forward to the conclusions. You know, the main point that I would like to leave you with today is that you know, over the last few decades, you know, there's been significant effort to, uh, to take advantage of this wealth of atmospheric composition measurements that are now available so that we can quantify the emissions of environmentally important trace gases for air quality and carbon cycle studies in my particular case, but you know, this applies for a range of other applications. And what's key is that the observing system as well as the data simulation tools that we have have reached a point where we can now provide information on surface sources and sinks of key uh, trace constituents on policy relevant scales. And a very nice example of that that I want to draw your attention to is the fact that the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, CEOS, that's an organization of uh, space agencies, have an activity to use observations of atmospheric CO2 and methane to provide 
uh, surface to atmospheric fluxes of these gases for the UNFCCC global stock take, which is part of, which is a component of their Paris Agreement. So this is a very nice example where we're reached a point where we can now start to use these data in an interesting policy relevant way. As we look to the future, we're going to need uh, to see a continued expan expansion of the observing system, both ground-based as well as space-based to provide constraints at greater spatial and temporal resolution. As we look to the future, you know, one exciting development that's coming down the pipeline are geostationary observations for air quality. We have GEMS, which is a Korean satellite. It's a geostationary satellite that was launched last year. Next year, we'll see the launch of TEMPO, which is a NASA geostationary air quality satellite, followed by the Sentinel-4, which is a European geostationary satellite. And then there's a geostationary carbon cycle satellite, GeoCarb, that's scheduled for launch probably in late 2023, maybe early 2024. And combining these geostationary measurements that will give us tremendous temporal resolution with some of the low Earth orbiting polar satellites will allow us to constrain you know, what's happening on the continents as well as to capture this intermental co continental transport of pollution very nicely. But to do that, we're going to need to continue to, to develop new data simulation approaches so that we can integrate these data effectively across a wide range of spatial and temporal scales because the chemistry covers a broad range of the temporal scales. The OH radical has a lifetime of seconds. Carbon monoxide has a lifetime of a month or a few months and methane has a lifetime of a decade. So there's a broad range of timescales that you have to deal with in your assimilation when you try to integrate these, these data. And so we're going to need to come up with much more computationally effective and uh, innovative data simulation approaches to deal with this growing wealth of observations. So I'll stop there and take any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elon, very much. Uh, I agree with, also with uh, uh, time scales, which are uh, really uh, makes a big issue in the assimilation of data and so on because it's uh, importance of the uh, resolution, etc. Et but anyway, it's I thank you very much for the wonderful uh, survey which you today uh, gave us a uh, survey through the uh, atmospheric uh, modeling, chemical modeling, and uh, how it's uh, uh, particularly the uh, uh, well, photovar and uh, um, uh, um, element filters techniques and so on is used in this modeling. Uh, we have uh, some time for questions, uh, uh, answers, and uh, as I mentioned, there are a few questions in the chat box. Uh, I can uh, read them.